I'm the city manager for City of Edmond. I just want to take a couple minutes to introduce um, what's taking place this morning. Uh, I, I think I woke up early this morning thinking this is kind of Christmas for me. This is the second time I've done this with the Urban Land Institute, uh, first in the Phoenix metro area and then now here. And it's always interesting and exciting. Um, so I'm grateful especially for our my bosses the most important people uh, outside of my family in my life right now is my bosses, is the city council. So we have Councilmember Mudd, Councilmember Chapman, Councilmember Moore, right? Councilmember Peterson, and the mayor is apparently doing speaking engagements with all of our Edmond High Schools today, so he's off doing higher ed. So with that, just some final comments. I'm grateful for all those who took the time over this week to visit with our distinguished panel. Uh, I know it took a lot of time out of your busy lives to take that hour and come down and give the feedback to them. We're grateful for, especially for our panel, and if anything, to have, know, what do we have, Tom, 12 of us, 12 of you guys, panel? 11. This is the fantastic 11. Um, to have them come into Edmond from all across the country with their different expertise to provide us an opportunity to, I'll call it, expand our horizons, expand our vision is so important. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to John Walsh, who's the chair. So, John. Thank you, Scott. And welcome, everyone. And uh, it is a pleasure to be here in Edmond and to share the expertise that we uh, at ULI have found to be very important in our ability to give back to communities. The mission of ULI is to shape the future of the built environment uh, with transformative impact in communities worldwide. Our, our effort here is part of the worldwide effort. Uh, and today, you guys are the center of the globe, if not the universe, and we're glad to be here. In, that, in performing that mission, we have decided that we are going to be a connector, we're going to be an inspirer, and we're going to be a leader in this industry. And uh, so we hopefully, we've given you the connection, the inspiration, and the leadership that you guys have uh, wanted. ULI Advisory Services Program is a program that has been engaged in activities similar to this for over 70 years. And with that, we have brought together these volunteers today that are experts. And I'm pretty, I'm just the chair. These guys are the experts, and you're going to hear the meat of the presentation from them because I, I just kind of organized it and it was a very easy organiz organizational challenge because they all were really uh, dead on on, it, on their effort, their knowledge, and their ability to take what you guys have given us and create a result. All right, there we go. Uh, and the sponsors, Scott's already thanked you. I'll thank you again. Uh, we wouldn't be here without the, the strong support from these sponsors, as well as the materials and the data and the interviews and the things that they were able to provide for us. Here's the stakeholders. I am not reading through all of these, but I can tell you, uh, we ended up visiting with over 100 people. Uh, 91 were officially in our interviews on Tuesday. But the rest of you, thank you very much for contributing. And we try to take to heart everything that you gave us and use it to uh, move forward in the decisions with regard to our presentation. Our assignment was a number of questions that were asked by the sponsors. Uh, they, really they really dealt with infill and redevelopment, local economic health, mobility, housing, real estate market, and problem properties. And of course, the impact that this university will have on the community uh, going forward. Uh, the study area is the, is the uh, uh, aerial on the right, and that study area included uh, downtown as kind of the center of it, but we went south of uh, second. It includes the campus. It includes the area west of the, of the tracks. So it is, it is a pretty, pretty small area, a mile in a 90-mile-plus uh, city. So, but it's a very important, as you'll see, we think it's one of the most important uh, square miles that you guys have to deal with. And we, we, have, we will give you some uh, ideas on how that includes. Our baseline was based on Edmund today. We had to look at your history and tie it in. So we've woven your history 
with today and looking into the future to try to create a, a roadmap uh, for the future. Greenfield versus infill. Uh, you guys are experts on greenfield. You know all the answers. Infield is the new is infill is the new challenge when you deal with this uh, study area. So we really spent a lot of time using our expertise and experience to share what we uh, have done in the past on that. The uh, University of Central Oklahoma and the city of Edmond, um, we had to look hard at that. And you guys have accomplished some things together that are incredible. We're going to show you some other ways that we think you can do things even more to really create more value in that area than you would if you just uh, move forward uh, business as usual. And we're going to look at this. Today, you're going to hear a lot about the heart of Edmund. And I'm not going to go through each of these because we do have experts that are going to tell you about these. I'm doing the summary. They're going to do the, the good stuff. I will say you're going to see toward the end this concept that we have about a catalytic city hall complex because we think that may be the most important feature for the future of the area downtown, south of downtown, tying in the campus. And you're going to see a lot of, of uh, information about that. As we move forward, we're going to have it in, in, in a kind of an order where Jeff Kosky is going to lay the framework with the data, the information, the numbers, and the things that will help you better understand uh, where we went after we got here. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, John. Good morning, Edmund. So my job this morning is to provide a little context. Uh, talk a little bit about trends, national trends, regional trends, local trends, and, and tell you a little bit about the things that really kind of the, the context that impacted our deliberations this week. Um, my role in my real job and my role this week was to look at the demographics and the economics and the real estate and, and use those elements to provide some perspective on the recommendations that my, um, my colleagues are going to be providing for you. So let's get started with this. Like the rest of the nation, the Oklahoma City region is undergoing societal shifts, right? We're in a inflection point in the nation, in the region, and here in Edmond. And the, there are new patterns of demographics, transportation, communication, lifestyles, and all of this is leading to transformative change in our nation and in your city. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the trends um, that are driving this transformative change. And one of those, particularly here in the Oklahoma City region, is population growth, right? When you're dealing with a growing region, that creates opportunities in a way is as if the region wasn't growing. And you're certainly growing here. As I like to say, the market speaks with its feet, all right? And the market's showing up in Edmond, uh, no doubt about it. Um, this is a preferred location for both residential and commercial expansion within the Oklahoma City region. Currently, Edmond's population is about 8 to 10 percent of the overall uh, region's population. But in the past three years, you can see on the screen here, um, Edmond has gained about 15 percent of the overall population growth. So, um, in my world, what we say in my, my market, I put on my market analyst hat and say that you are increasing your regional market share, right? You're increasing your regional market share, and that's a big deal. Um, and so looking forward, you're at about 100,000 people. You're expected to add maybe about 40,000 people, which as it turns out is about the entire size of the city of Bartlesville is going to be showing up in the next 30 years. Right. So by the time you get to 2050, you're going to be a significantly larger place. The growth is coming. It's not going to stop. You're going to add an entire city of Bartlesville, which, by the way, is the 13th largest city in Oklahoma. So it's, it's not nothing. Um, and so where are all these people going to live? That really became an essential piece of our deliberations, the housing. How do you house all of these new people over the next 30 years? So. That has become, again, you'll hear a lot about housing, and we think, and this is the key about this, is that it requires new thinking. You're not going to house all the people with the old way of thinking. You must think differently to house the people that are showing up here. Another trend that we've talked about is, is the sticky pandemic trends, right, that um, I like to call 
um, well, the sticky, the, the trends from the pandemic that are sticky, that means they're sticking around. They emerged during the pandemic and you, you're, you're still dealing with them. Um, and so again, the pandemic is maybe waning, but its impact has not stopped and it will continue for the next at least decade. And so in this new environment that we're in, home buyers and renters have reset their priorities. And they have now a shifting emphasis, right? Again, a new way of thinking. Um, people are seeking suburban growth more often, and we're working from home. Again, just uh, um, among the many trends that we know we're still dealing with coming out of the pandemic. We are dealing with housing affordability issues that have been prompted by the pandemic. Um, it's increasingly difficult around the nation, but here in Edmond as well, to purchase or rent a home that is appropriate for a household income. And so it's especially difficult for households below the area median income to find appropriately priced housing. So the panel believes that Edmonds historic core is uniquely positioned, uniquely positioned to provide additional housing stock at a wide range of home prices, including attainable housing to those essential workers that served us all so well during the pandemic and still serve us today. Another trend that we've uh, been assessing, smaller households are ascending, um, which is a fancy way to say that United States households are getting smaller. We're shrinking. Our household size is shrinking. We're much smaller on average as a household size than we were during the 20th century. These smaller households are often choosing a different way to live lower maintenance, convenience, quality public amenities instead of larger homes on acreage. Now, the home, larger homes on acreage aren't going anywhere. You got that in spades. It's just a matter of what I'm going to call growing the pie, right? And so this, the results in this new household paradigm, if you will, um, result in a demand for, again, a diverse range of housing types. In today's marketplace, multifamily units, multi-generational housing, accessory dwelling units, and so forth are all viable options for many households. Detached single family housing, as you can see on the, in the chart on the right here, represents more than three-fourths of Edmonds homes. Right? That's, the, that's, that's the historical tale of, of suburban growth that you all mastered. Um, and so, however, in today's world, two thirds of your households are made up of one and two people. So what we see is a mismatch. Your housing stock is not matched up with your populace. And so as Edmonds population swells, the market will continue to seek a range of housing choices. And again, emphasizing the study area is a prime location to allow the market to provide the supply to match the changing demand. We already see the market, the private market showing up and responding to this situation. Currently, residents in the study area represent 10% of overall Edmond population. Looking forward, looking at the East Edmond 2050 plan, there's an idea that you may grow at about 100 or 1,300 new residents annually for the next decades. Over 1,000 people every year showing up in Edmond, new folks. If the study area was to capture at its current share, right, which is only about 10%. So if only 10% of the new homes go into the study area, you're not going to get there. You've got to allow the study area to increase its ability to provide housing to meet the demand, right? And so, um, sorry, the study area, again, is exceeding its fair share of growth already, right? People are moving there. There's 750 new homes that are in the development pipeline. Folks are continuing to come. There is pent up demand that the supply is, is trying to meet, but we believe that you've got to continue to find ways to provide a range of housing across the entire city and downtown is the place where you can meet the demand for that growing market segment that I mentioned to. Thus the area is ready um, to is, is ready to help Edmund meet the demand. In fact, because his current marketing position and the upside potential that is latent in the study area, pursuing additional catalytic public and private sector projects can grow the pie. So in other words, if you do the status quo, you're not really going to get there in the way that you need to. Something catalytic needs to happen 
to continue to attract folks to live downtown in order to meet the challenges go going forward. So the idea is, my colleagues and I, we believe that, the, that based on the study area capturing a greater share of the overall growth that you can compete. You can compete with areas that you've never competed for before, with before. You can be in the game to attract households that would have otherwise gone to places like Quail Run or Midtown. So these are areas that folks that are looking to be in Edmond, want to be in Edmond, but not necessarily finding what they're looking for today. So they're going to these other areas. We're saying if you expand the options, you can compete and out-compete with some of the other uh, uh, locations around the region. Looking forward, we think that with some catalytic enhancements within the study area, you can help drive new demand, which will provide additional support for the local tax base in both commercial and property taxes. So based on the assumption that the study area can capture this greater share, we would expect the study area could add up to 2,500 new residential units. This is only uh, uh, yeah, new residential homes in the next decade. This expectation will only occur if the inclusion of the types of catalytic projects that you're about to hear about. This amount of res residential growth will create additional support for new commercial square footage. This commercial square footage is likely to be both residential, uh, retail and office. We think you've got a potential to kind of open up a new office market potentially downtown with the catalytic um, opportunities that we think you can capture. So with the proper development and execution and marketing and ongoing operations, the study area can continue to exceed the rate of growth that is occurring throughout the city and become a true regional draw, bringing additional community members and visitors who can add to the vibrancy of Edmond while at the same time enhancing the tax base. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it off to my friend, John, who's gonna talk a little bit more about the housing that I was referring to. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so uh, as Jeff mentioned, I'm here to speak to you a bit about uh, housing attainability in your, in your community and how that uh, uh, housing impacts uh, your uh, essential workers in, in the community. Uh, so as, is, as has been mentioned, the panel feels strongly uh, that the downtown core is particularly well suited uh, for the inclusion of higher density, mixed income, mixed use development uh, that will support a broader range of housing options in your community. Uh, so providing this broader range of housing options is, is key to allowing the downtown core to evolve into a vibrant uh, and active district. Uh, these mixed income developments will integrate essential worker housing into market rate projects so that you don't have a particular a uh, project that's just for essential workers and one that's market rate, the, the units will be integrated into both, into a single project, essentially. Uh, so um, essential worker housing just makes sense in the downtown core for a number of reasons. Um, the, the area is already dense, right? So you already have uh, a, a collection of smaller lots, uh, more co compact development. Uh, existing income levels in the downtown area uh, are more in line with essential workers in your community. So this essentially says that this is where the housing need, is needed because this is where the essential workers are that have been able to uh, uh, be lucky enough to find a unit, a housing unit in your community. They're already here in the downtown core area. So it makes most sense to uh, to provide the housing here uh, in the downtown. And as I mentioned, these smaller lots that are present in downtown, they facilitate a broader range of housing typologies uh, as opposed to the traditional single family home with the large uh, surrounding uh, you know yard. Um, so it's more conducive to uh, the, the sort of essential worker housing development that we're looking to, 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 to uh, provide, right? Uh, how do we choose to define uh, the population of your community? Because this is a, a key in terms of discussing how uh, essential workers interact with your local economy, right? Uh, so uh, Edmond, Oklahoma, total population, uh, this is 2020 census figures, so I know that we're higher than this now, but let's just go with figures that, you know, everyone can accept. Uh, you know, just under 100,000. Um, but uh, the interesting aspect to uh, to these population figures is that uh, your your population during the daytime is not 100,000, right? Uh, your population during the daytime is actually 120,000 because we have to include those commuters that come in every day. And this does not include students, by the way. This data does not include students that come into the, this is just workers that come into the community every day to work in your community uh, because they simply can't afford to live here, right? And so uh, that uh, sort of net 
number of commuters into Edmond every day uh, results in, uh, in a fact that one of every five people that's walking in the street of, Evan, of, of Edmond, uh, streets of Edmond during the day, is not a resident of Edmond, right? One out of every five people who you walk around and see in the street every day is not a resident of Edmond. Uh, this tends to add to traffic congestion, right? That's just the logic. It, it adds to traffic congestion. It makes uh, mobility more difficult and getting around town more difficult. Uh, it makes just, it's an unintended consequence of an incomplete sort of housing portfolio, right? So uh, I wanted to talk about an example that is the, from my personal experience, is the worst case scenario, right? Uh, I've uh, worked for several years, five or six years, uh, five or six years. Uh, for the state of Wyoming and uh, made uh, many, many trips to Jackson, got very familiar with the area, saw a change over that, over that time, even, even during that short time. And uh, Jackson is facing a situation of extreme housing affordability sh shortage, right? This is an extreme example. Um, so I don't want you to think this, that you'll ever get here, right? Because I don't think you'll ever get here as a community, but it's just uh, an example of how bad it can be, right? Right. And so... Um, in Jackson, you have a daytime population of almost 17,000. I can tell you now, these are 20, 20 figures. I can tell you now it's closer to, uh, it's over 17,000, closer to 18,000. Uh, you know, Jackson's population uh, has commuters uh, that make uh, one out of every three to four people in town uh, a person who cannot afford to live there. So one out of every three, three to four people is not a resident of Jackson during the daytime. So that's an extreme example. Uh, Highway 22 uh, in Jackson, Wyoming, which travels west from Jackson, Wyoming into the suburbs uh, just across the border in Idaho. Highway 22 is the busiest stretch of highway in the state of Wyoming. Uh, busier than Casper, any, anywhere in Casper, busier than anywhere in Cheyenne, the two largest cities. A town of just over 10,000 people has the busiest highway in the state. So that's, that's the extreme example that no one wants to sort of emulate, right? So let's take a moment to uh, define what we mean by essential worker. Um, and I won't go into the, I won't read the whole uh, description here because you guys are, you're, on, you're all in college right now, so you can read. But um, workforce housing is essential, is essential for, or is housing for essential workers, or workers whose presence in the local economy is critical to a success, right? You, your economy won't work without these folks. And so uh, you can either have the Jackson approach, right? And bring them all in all in every day and all out and create traffic nightmares, or you can integrate them into your community, right? And create a, a true create a true community here in Edmond. Uh, we talked to a lot of employers, and uh, a lack of essential housing or essential worker housing is negatively impacting their business operations. And we talked to large employers, we talked to small employers. Uh, same story. It's impacting their ability to, to operate their businesses. Uh, because they cannot recruit employees uh, in, uh, who are residents of the area. Uh, recruitment comes a, a challenge for these for these uh, for these folks. Uh, some employers that we talk to have, have resorted to cash incentives, right, to uh, to get people to actually work uh, in the community. Uh, gas and travel expenses uh, to get people to actually work in the community. That all impacts business operations. Uh, we found that many employers have employees that must commute into town from up to 30 or 40 miles away. Um, and these employees are just naturally less reliable than employees that are five miles away, three miles away, right? It's just logical. So, you know, this impact upon your, I guess the point of this whole slide is to say this impact upon your community has already begun. It's already started, right? So we're not talking about something that could happen. It is happening. So that's the part of the story. Uh, the second part of the story in terms of the impact of, of housing attainability upon your, upon your community, um, a lack of housing options in Edmond is also fostering a, a long-term cyclical problem associated with young people here, right? So uh, young professionals, young people who grew up here, natives of your community, right? Uh, they, uh, they can either uh, go to your local uh, K through 12 schools or if they went to the UCO, uh, when they exit their ex exit their educational institution and start their professional career, can they start that professional career here in Edmond? Is the question. Um, with the lack of housing options for them, uh, the answer is it makes it very difficult. Um, they, lots of younger professionals will make a rational choice to relocate to the core city, right? Which in this case is Oklahoma, Oklahoma City or elsewhere to begin their careers because this is where they can find affordable housing that is suitable to their, uh, to their age and demographic. Uh, this youth flight is an ongoing cycle that drains Edmund of its most visible, energetic, and vocal advocates. 
the only way to break the cycle is really to, prov to provide a path forward for younger professionals to stay in the community, which means providing a broader range of housing options, right? Which we again think are particularly well suited for the study area or for your downtown. All right, so um, recommendations for change, right? How, how, I, all this uh, doom and gloom, I, I didn't want to end on that. Um, so recommendations for change, uh, quick fixes. There are quick fixes. There are things you can do uh, starting Monday, right? And there are things that you can, uh, are gonna take longer term, uh, more planning, more development, more, uh, more activity, but uh, in terms of, and more regulatory changes, right? But in terms of uh, quick fixes, um, you know, the promotion of accessory dwelling units is something that's easy. It's low hanging fruit uh, it's our, and duplexes as well. These are already permitted uses in your downtown core, right? So just promoting those uses, make sure that those, those uh, sorts of, config, of housing configurations are approved by the city, uh, you know, in an expeditious manner are uh, promoted by the city as an option. Uh, the downtown core overlay district that you already have, that ordinance can always be modified to promote further density if you choose. Um, and, you know, people think about density and, and promoting density in, in an area and, it, and people kind of, you know, get a little shaky. Um, there are ways to get around that. You can always, you know, develop a pre-approved set of plans, uh, basic plans, uh, so that people who are developers in the, in the community who want to build and want to build this product in your community can have a predictability as to the outcome, right? Okay, we know this is going to get approved because this is a pre-approved set that the city has given me. So uh, they can make modifications to it and make it their own. Uh, but um, just a way to kind of streamline the, that approval and get uh, the city approvals in a place where they can support the development of housing uh, uh, choices in your downtown. A longer term solutions will include a focus on, on the downtown core area and infill development in the downtown core area, um, facilitating the development of mixed income rental housing developments, right? So again, I mentioned it before, these are not separate housing developments that are for essential workers. These are essential ho worker housing units that are integrated into market rate developments, right? And uh, this can be facilitated through a number of means. Uh, the tax credit program uh, that I've worked with uh, extensively in, in the state of Wyoming is probably the, um, the most efficient or the most uh, popular and most widely used around the country. Um, but uh, providing that, you know, this, uh, these uh, sorts of developments um, and then also uh, providing a, an expedited path for city approval of smaller scale uh, for sale product in the downtown core area so that your smaller scale developers can also take part in, in addressing your, your housing issues, right, right. And so um, having said all that, I will pass it off to uh, Ms. Ann Taylor, who will uh, take us further. Thanks, John. And I'm going to race through this as fast as I can because there is some really good stuff coming up next. I also want to uh, let you all know that there will be a very detailed written report that will come out later. I'm going to talk about some strategic imperatives. When we did our interviews this week, people expressed real passion and enthusiasm for Edmund. We also heard some skepticism about whether or not this might be another study with a lot of great ideas that would gather dust. What I want you to know is what will make the difference between whether it's another study or it spurs action is really the collaboration, the communication, and the opportunity for people to partner maybe in new and innovative ways. I'm also gonna uh, describe really quickly an idea of not an either or, but a yes and. One of the questions that we were asked to look at or that we were thinking about was whether um, some of the development would concentrate on the I-35 corridor or in the central core, what we call downtown. And I would say to you, it's not an either or, it's a yes and. Rather than choose one or the other as an area of focus, we urge Edmund to embrace and enhance both the I-35 corridor and the greater downtown core, including University of Central Oklahoma campus, a revitalized Main Street Square, and the historic downtown. Each of these centers can increase the velocity of commerce, serving different and important audiences with different and invaluable experiences. Maximizing opportunities in all of these key areas is necessary to lift the economic tide of Edmund, generating revenue to fund important projects as well as their maintenance. So <laughs> I am not opposed to silos. I actually think they're really cool. 
And um, so it's not a criticism of those, but I want you to think about silos and how people live in them. We're all very busy. We have so much on our plate. We have so much to tend to that it's very easy to get our heads down and focus on what we're doing and miss the opportunities to collaborate, partner, share resources, and actually create something greater than the sum of individual parts. I also put this picture up here of the aquatic center to say, you can stay in your own lane, but be in the same pool together. It's also a wonderful example of a successful collaboration. The city, the schools, the YMCA created something amazing that's become a regional draw and a very active part of the community. We'd love to see more of that. We're gonna to talk to you also about other cities that you can look to and learn from. You're not alone in the challenges that you're facing. And so we are gonna recommend some cities that also relate to major metropolitan areas in somewhat the same way that Edmond relates to Oklahoma City. Alpharetta, Georgia, outside of Atlanta is an example. And I hope you have warm feelings for Texas. If you don't, we'll just move right along. But Sugarland and the Woodlands outside of Houston are two other examples of communities that have the same roughly population as Edmond. And they are affluent communities as well. Pueblo, Colorado is also about the same size, although not wealthy, has made good use of many of the financial tools that we will be talking about in more detail in our written report. You also have a great resource in ULI, Oklahoma. They are people who share their experience and they do it as volunteers. This ULI panel today has more than 275 years of collective experience unraveling thorny land use development and public policy questions. And they could help you find dozens more cities that are facing similar challenges and to help come up with new and creative ways to meet those new and different demands. I'm going to transition now to talking about those strategic environment uh, imperatives. Brand. What is a brand? Well, collectively, it's an idea that sets a course forward. What does Edmund want to be? And the good news for Edmund is you have an incredible toolkit of raw materials that you can build on. Communities all over the country would be envious of what you have going for you. And you know this probably even better than I do. I could list many more um, wonderful assets this community has. Weaving all those parts together is what will bring you together around a shared story, a collective vision that motivates and activates people. But to be a great place to grow, Edmund will need to have a continual focus on maintenance, upkeep, and even renovation in the focus area that we're going to talk about because cities are never done. Again, alignment around an exciting vision for the future can give everyone a common sense of purpose. And that common purpose needs to bring us together in a way around a story that everyone can adopt and amplify. This requires an intentional approach to collaboration, alignment around this shared purpose for the community. And I'm advocating, we're advocating a defined body because at the end of the day, if something is everyone's job, it's no one's job. This suggestion is not meant to imply that there are any shortcomings in any of the people that are working very diligently every day. They are spread thin, they have a ton on their plates, and, and generally they are not focused day in and day out on the, the area of focus we are going to be looking at for the rest of the day today. So one of our key recommendations is a central, central Edmund Advisory Council. It's a body that comes together that is responsible for collaboration and communication to make sure that the exciting things that are going on in, on campus are shared widely in the community. 
and to make sure that all the different parties around the table who can make a positive impact for change are doing what they can to implement and create results. I'm also going to recommend three linchpin people. And the first one is what we're calling a central admin development ombudsman, an advocate who will come alongside the private developer with a philosophy of facilitation. They're responsible for helping them navigate the process with ease if those developers are following guidelines that will result in projects that enhance and enrich greater downtown. The next linchpin person is a Main Street manager. This is boots on the ground, someone who's daily working on implementation of projects, keeping the sidewalks clean, healthy landscaping, events and programming support. This is an individual who's accountable to business owners to make sure they're seeing follow through on priority projects. Again, <laughs> this is not saying these things are not happening, but we're defining a more narrow focus for these efforts to take place. And finally, a director of marketing, communications, and programming. This person would be the evangelist and the glue responsible for activation and programming, coordinating the efforts of all the different wonderful groups that are doing things to bring life and vibrancy into the community. This person would be responsible for communication and collaboration to make sure all of the key stakeholders are engaged. The reason that we are advocating this intense level of focus and responsibility is that the focus area can become a more vital heartbeat of this community. This is an example of where I work back home, and our mission is to champion and enhance downtown as a connected and thriving place for everyone. So Edmund is ready to turn a fresh page with a common purpose, an inspiring aspiration, a compelling story everyone can rally around and amplify and the people who are responsible to get it done. And now I'm going to turn it over to Tamala Thornton, who's going to go into more detail about the specific action steps to take. Thank you, Anne. Appreciate that. Um, we've heard about demographic trends. We've heard about housing options. But the question now is really, how do you get all of this work done? As a former developer, I recognize that transformation is sometimes a difficult challenge, but transformation of the study area, we believe, will require coordinated municipal actions based on clearly documented processes, standards, and guidelines that are easy to understand, fact-based, consistent, objective, and lead to timely implementation. You know, there's been a lot of good development to date that's been creative and opportunistic, particularly in how we've used public tools. But what's been delivered has been positive, but public processes may not have been as smooth as they need to be. The city's responsibility is to make it clear to private investors, current residents and businesses that their decisions will be fact-based, predictable, and timely. Some specific improvements are required to establish those guidelines to facilitate this implementation and planning. Those improvements are really defined to set the canvas for future growth, and they can be both structural process improvements as well as physical improvements. We're gonna talk about the structural process improvements first. And first and most importantly, the panel recommends that the city implement a study area overlay zoning code to codify design standards and site plan approval processes. We talked a little bit about having plan sets that were previously approved or have been previously documented to facilitate growth and, and to facilitate engagement. We believe that this overlay process needs to be completed as soon as possible and can be managed by the Central Edmond Urban District Board. And the overlay shouldn't wait for the other changes that are gonna be made in the entire code. One of the reasons that we think this is important is a form-based code allows for expedited entitlements and accelerated approvals for uses that have been targeted and discussed. Some specific form-based regulations may add a little bit of cost or discourage less impactful projects, 
but the format facilitates a thoughtful, process-oriented evaluation of a development proposal. Like I said, I'm a developer, and development projects by nature are unique. But developers and their capital partners, more importantly, want to know what to expect from each step of the process and their interaction with approving entities. The overlay standard is really grounded in fostering that predictability. Once it's in place, all city development disciplines, planning, engineering, permitting, must be aligned to execute in a cohesive and expedient manner. There may be documented guidelines for the downtown core that are different from subdistricts that are a little bit more residential, but the overlay really can facilitate continuity continuity of the development vision that's been established and then continu continuity of implementation of approval processes. Some other structural components really also must be addressed to really set this canvas that we've identified as the canvas for the future growth. Comprehensive storm management and infrastructure planning are one of those areas. The city's gonna need to address some of the aging infrastructure, which clearly exists because this, the city's been in place for and developing for multiple, almost 100 years, and some of those infrastructures are going to be impacted by, by future private investment. Efforts have clearly been made with the Stevenson Park stormwater management, but similar planning work should be applied to other areas in the district to really encourage development. Opportunities include planning to upgrade utilities and incorporate new technology and transportation modes in the overall structure. Secondly, there's going to have to be a process of managing these activities to really shepherd that implementation forward. And mention the concept of an ombudsman, but the role of this position really will be to help manage the delivery of public improvement in the area, negotiate and memorialize public-private partnerships, participate in structuring the capital stack and funding commitments for those projects, and then coordinating with the public public works or other entities where appropriate. And then finally, it's, it's an opportunity to optimize the development impacts by optimizing appropriate finance tools. There's some tools that are currently in place. The TIF, TIF formed in 2020, $55 million, which is available to finance public improvements. The panel recommends that 100% of these TIF funds are used as seed money or local matching funds to be leveraged against other public and private sources such as economic development administration grants, private foundation dollars, or other capital improvement programs aimed specifically in the study area. Other, other tools such as tax credits, particularly if you look at downtown, which has at its heart a historic core that can be leveraged by using historic tax credits. And then I know we've had multiple conversations around the business improvement district. Clearly that process, that initiative stalled, but we believe that the effectiveness of bids is, is, is effective. In fact, we encourage continued conversations around the bid concept. But while we're working towards finalizing what ultimately that structure should be, their programs, it's a Main Street America program, which is an opportunity to provide some essential management functions necessary and pay for those functions necessary to implement some of these recommendations. And unlike a bid, the Main Street program is likely funded by the city and other nonprofit organizations, but over time, as the tax base develops in the study area and property owners are able to identify very specific benefits and very specific requirements for a bid to manage, that Main Street organization may grow into the bid. Now, there are also some specific physical improvement priorities that are recommended in the study area to support the catalytic growth. The first obviously is the city hall redevelopment. The city hall redevelopment can be a catalyst for surrounding private activity, but on its own, a municipal building isn't an attraction that supports activity throughout the day and into the evening. It's a building that's only activated during the weekday for working hours. So as a result, any thinking around planning for city hall massing should really be thinking about what are the complementary uses, complementary activities that need to be incorporated into a redevelopment plan to make sure that you're creating opportunities and activities throughout the day and through the week. But the city has an opportunity here as well, because any public building project 
should really set the community development standards. It should set the standards for materials, for design style options, for scale, and for the historical aesthetic. I mentioned other uses that are complementary, such as a public green. Those should be encouraged. And our design team is going to talk a little bit more about how that might all come together. It's important that parking is available. We've talked a lot about parking in some of the panels. And in a vibrant district, I think people began to recognize that not all customers can park right in front of the store that they're going to. Yeah. Parking should be available within a reasonable three to four block walking distance, but it also needs to be positioned to be available for use by different user types throughout the day. The 2020 Edmund Parking Plan identified opportunities to look at different ways to implement parking to tailor how parking is used in the district and how parking availability, accessibility, and location defines how people move through the district. And we recommend that the, their recommendations should be followed. And finally, a strong core is really defined by the activities that surround the core. And there are a series of sub-districts that have started to evolve to date that have been opportunistic from a development standpoint, and in some ways, a little bit incremental, resulting in a series of projects that in and of themselves, they're inter interesting and impactful, but in collectively, they're probably a little bit too small in scale to create that vibrant sustainability that's really required to build a long-term core. This is because they aren't necessarily connected to each other in any meaningful, organized way. There aren't necessarily signs or wayfinding way uh, opportunities that are reinforcing the mix of uses in the area and the connections between those uses. And there aren't any really clear paths to distinguish how activity and how people move in the, in the district, how vehicles move, how pedestrians move, and how folks in other uh, modes of transit move. So subdistrict connectivity is gonna be critical to strengthening the downtown. And so there's some opportunities that we'll be taking a look at. The first is the UCO link, and it's linking downtown to UCO using arts to really join civic and community focused uses. The second is that Stevenson Park link, which really will strengthen the engagement of the strong residential communities that are currently existing and that are being developed. And it also provides with that linkage, some clear opportunities to distinguish the path for vehicles and for pedestrians. We know that there some, have been some challenges in the downtown area between pedestrians and vehicles and who, and who kind of win, wins the war of crossing the street. We want to make, make sure that there's some clear opportunities to facilitate that. And then there's been development that's been occurring on the west side of the, of the rail tracks. There's got to be some real clear thinking on how to make the linkages and clarify the linkages and connection points that facilitate crossing the rail track to continue to encourage that new investment, as well as redevelopment that is consistent with some of the housing conversation that we were having earlier. We talked about some of the hardscape physical improvements, and we've also had conversations around housing. But again, I just want to reiterate, housing is a critical component to the revitalization of a downtown core. Commercial and retail development will fail without a strong and diverse, and when I say diverse, it's age, it's income, it's interests, it's, it's day part, and I, when people say day parts, what is day? Breakfast and morning, lunch and dinner, dinner and evening, evening and weekend activity. And without a variety of housing types and price points, right now there are very few places for young singles and young families to live in Edmond. The city cannot lose its opportunity right now to use its ability to provide direct support for starter homes or establish certain minimum unit count requirements for essential employee housing on municipally owned parcels that are currently owned or will be made available through the city hall redevelopment process or projects that request or receive any municipal incentives. And then, Connectivity solutions will be addressed that recognize that Edmond is a car-based and will be by nature of it being a suburban environment. It's a car-based, car-based basis is the reality. So as we plan multimodal ac activity and access points, we really need to recognize that, gotta be clear, think about how cars work with 
pedestrian focused streets. And those are streets that may, may be much more focused to people walking, bicycle traffic, low, low access modes versus your main streets and your broadways and bro that are a little bit more vehicularly focused. Within that context, we encourage enhancement to Broadway. I mean, Broadway in many instances is, is a main entry into the, into the downtown core. And the collection of vape shops, quick service restaurants, auto repair facilities, in some ways is incompatible with much of the growth that we're trying to encourage in the downtown core. However, as those businesses are there, efforts need to be made to utilize existing funding to really build up the profile of that, of that area, including facade improvements for storefronts that lead into the district. And finally, it's really important for recognition that multimodal access really works best when it's connected to key destinations. And so that's a big part of what you're going to see in plans that Ross is going to start talking about to us. Thank you, Tamala. So we want to emphasize how transportation infrastructure can provide the solid platform to accommodate and support well the kind of population increase, the increase in variety of housing types that will occur downtown and do this by addressing the full range of transportation needs, access, circulation, transit, and parking, so that visitors have a convenient, physically safe, and comfortable visit downtown, and so that there's good support for new infill development throughout the uh, district. So some of the specifics, creating that platform, starting with a solid pedestrian bicycle network. The city has already done a lot of really good homework and development on its trail system. We want to emphasize the need to complete that and accelerate it. Our specific recommendation would be that the trail system start at the northwest corner of the downtown core. Uh, there's the uh, stormwater uh, pond up at West Herd and Fretz. There's already a little loop trail. Start there, work your way through downtown on Main Street, over into the UCO campus, down to Fink Park, Hafer Park, and all the way to Arcadia Lake. That gives you a six mile long trail. You've got a lot of that in place, but we emphasize accelerating the completion of that trail. And then, adding extensions from Stevenson Park area, east to the trail, north into downtown. That'll be fundamental to supporting the number of people that will start living downtown and make visitors um, have a, an additional um, bit of fun while there. There is a crossing of Second Avenue for the trail, but there may be the opportunity to investigate a bridge over that. There's higher ground on the university side. There's some challenges with um, overhead electrical lines, but create, adding a bridge there, if possible, could create a signature feature on the trail, as well as a visual gateway to both the campus and the downtown. And then throughout the district, upgrading sidewalks, curb ramps, and pedestrian crossings will be fundamental to keeping people safe, physically safe. Alleys, you know they need work. So an upgrade program throughout to provide consistent quality of pavement that will help with drainage. It'll make them fully functional for service and parking access. And it gives businesses the chance to do some backdoor things that may attract pedestrians. Uh, around the country, we're seeing a lot of very interesting alley developments, put people there evenings and weekends, not the time the trash truck's coming through, but it enlivens the use of this important public right-of-way. And those sorts of improvements can be coordinated with utility upgrades, um, electrical, fiber, or other conduits that run through the alleys, do it as one program. Transit, we know you're looking at the potential of... Um, rail connection coming up from Oklahoma City. 
our recommendation is to retain the transit hub at the existing festival market and then make that tie into the uh, the rail if it comes here. We say that because it is the best site we think for pedestrian access. Transit is only successful if people can walk to and from it and people can only use it if it's convenient to get there. You've got the facility right downtown where the most people will be. We think that's the best place. Some of that's beyond your call because the uh, the railroad has uh, significant oversight to what happens on its right of way, but our recommendation is to keep it there. Longer term, consider relocating the farmer's market. Brent will talk about how and where we uh, think that might happen. Then a number of street improvements. You've already anticipated a lot of these, but I want to talk about particular details. The goal is to size key streets downtown to serve the needs of downtown, not just everything that chooses to come through. So in the downtown core from second up to Campbell, you've already done a lot of work, a lot of options. Our recommendation is a two lane street with angled parking. This is pretty much consistent with option B in the uh, Broadway corridor visioning study. It has a number of advantages. It retains the parking that businesses need. It's convenient for shoppers. It's ample capacity for the volume of traffic that'll be there now and for some years in the future. It offers wider sidewalks, better pedestrian conditions, it allows for outdoor cafes, but up against the building rather than out in the street. Much more attractive, safer, very pleasant. And the angled parking, I grew up just north of here in Kansas, and I've spent much of my life in small towns. Angled parking is just kind of part of the heritage and the character. There's no reason to get rid of it. It's, um, it's an easy inexpensive parking resource. Now, that's the core. There need to be transitions on Broadway, both north and south. South of second, reduce the width of that street from the six lanes to four lanes with a turn lane. Enhance the plantings in the median so that it's really attractive. This will help slow traffic, provide a much more gracious entry to the downtown and give you a lot more latitude about what happens on the other side of the curb uh, for both uh, plantings and pedestrian facilities. North of the core, north of Campbell, look at a three lane cross section. That would well serve the primarily residential uses north of that area, would reduce the tendency for rear end collisions, create a, a shorter pedestrian crossing of the street, and help manage traffic speeds. Then moving east over on to Boulevard, very challenging street, so we have heard. Investigate a new signal at Main Street with better pedestrian crossings. You'll see why we say that based on what Brent talks about next. And then look at improvements at each of the other intersections. Small planters or raised islands in the very center of the intersection give traffic a better sense of direction, provide better visual continuity with the planted median, help slow traffic and aid pedestrians. And again, plant that median richly using native uh, landscaping. Make Boulevard live up to its name. It's really the only significant boulevard in the community. It's a great opportunity. Then the biggest challenge downtown faces is what to do with 2nd Street between Broadway and um, Boulevard and University. That is a tough nut. Basically, you have a highway running through the middle of your downtown. If you consider downtown to be pretty much the study area we have, it's entirely possible that there's a lot of through traffic using that. It's designated uh, Highway 77 to 66. We suggest um, that the basic strategy here be to size the street for the needs of downtown and its immediate surroundings. 
So work with ODOT to see about taking city jurisdiction of the street so that you have full control of what happens. But some homework needs to be done to understand who's using that street now and what the traffic patterns are. Find out how much of that traffic is through traffic versus local access. That can be done using digital data collection techniques in real time, as well as with regional traffic modeling. I suspect, sticking my neck out here, just looking at it, that at least one third of the traffic out there right now is effectively through traffic trying to get to I-35. But you've got many other interchanges that get you over to 35 on 15th, on 33rd, even north up on Danforth. Traffic can redistribute. If your findings are that there is quite a bit of through traffic, then you've got the opera and you get control of the street, you've got the opportunity to look at narrowing that to a three lane cross section, better for pedestrians, adequate to meet downtown and local access needs. And those other routes should be adequate to absorb the redistributed traffic. When you know that, future, then you can figure out what to do with the second and Broadway intersection. The standard there should be, it should be designed to a very high standard. It's your gateway and it's going to link the core area with the, all the development potential to the south. It's a really prominent um, place to get right. It's too soon to know what to do, but if you can rest control of both Broadway to the south and second to the east, then you can probably do some really good things with this intersection. So that's how transportation can become a platform to support the kind of development needed to accommodate the population and housing growth uh, that we see for the future. And to talk more about what that transportation platform can do for downtown is Brent. Thank you, Ross. And thank you all. Uh, we we uh, appreciate your attention uh, and, uh, and, and sticking around here to hear all of our thoughts. Uh, I'm going to start off by talking about uh, the sub-districts that Tamla uh, referred to in her portion of, of our discussion today. Uh, and, and really, this is uh, a tool that you can use to uh, create the uh, a variety of different uh, areas within your downtown. You already have some of those today, right? You have the some that are that are building, that are growing. Downtown has been here for a long time. Stevenson Park is is up and coming. The area west of the tracks, uh, as as we have called downtown West District is also coming up out of the ground as we speak. Um, there are opportunities to, to use these sub-districts in a variety of different ways. One of them is to just help focus where you want development to occur first and today. What is going to be the most beneficial place for your city to grow? And you can focus that. These sub-districts also give people a way to the to wayfind through your downtown. They give the people that live there and work there a sense of place. Uh, they also give those people neighborhood pride. Hey, I live in Stevenson Park or I live in downtown, right? That becomes a source of pride for those residents. It also gives you the opportunity to consider whether you want all of downtown to have the same style and character or whether you want these sub-districts to be able to express themselves a little bit. As you can see, these sub-districts, again, are, are laid out in a way that, that starts to begin to focus what maybe some of that redevelopment opportunity may be. To expand upon that, um, you know, there's really a tremendous opportunity that the city has in front of them. The city's endeavor to build a new city hall and municipal court is more than creating a new place for residents to do their business with the city or a fresh and collaborative space for staff to work. This is an opportunity to build 
the heart of the community that will span for generations. The panel believes that this opportunity to be bold, intentional, and thoughtful regarding the impact this can have to create a place for all of Edmond. With the location of City Hall and the core of downtown, it has the ability to truly become the heart of the community and spark new life into downtown. This spark not only has the potential to create new development that will bring new residents, businesses, and entertainment to downtown, but it will bring a physical and emotional center to your community, creating a place that Edmonites will embrace as their own and show their community pride. I'm gonna give you a couple of precedents of communities that I've had direct experience with that have done things that have, have achieved just this. I'm gonna start with Valparaiso, Indiana. It is a bedroom community of Chicago, twice as far from Chicago as Edmond is to Oklahoma City, but still a place that has been, uh, has had tremendous pressure from the late 2000s into today of people that are seeking a lifestyle choice that uh, is good for their families, a place where they can spread out a little bit more than living in downtown Chicago or within the suburbs. Realizing this in 2010, the city embarked on the creation of Central Park Plaza. Central Park Plaza uh, was uh, prior to the improvement, a surface parking lot and a vacant lot. The city decided we are gonna take that, we're gonna create a 1.3 acre park right in the center of our downtown because this is gonna give our residents a place to gather, uh, a place to recreate. This park has a multi-purpose lawn, it has an interactive fountain, and it has a stage and band shell where they host uh, many sized events. As you can see in that bottom picture, they have a tremendous festival going on. Little known fact, Valparaiso is the home of Orville Redenbacher. So they have the popcorn festival every year. And I'm pretty sure that's exactly when that picture was taken. With the success of Central Park Plaza, they expanded their public uh, uh, investment in building the William E. Urschel Pavilion in 2015. This is a covered open air facility uh, with multifunctions. In the winter, they have an ice skating rink that is used for everything from recreational skating to hockey practice. And in the summer months and uh, in the shoulder months, they have arts festivals. That is where their farmer's market occurs. Uh, and they have other community activities that take place uh, in that pavilion. These two public amenities that were created by the city have created a destination downtown that has sparked the renewal of restaurants and retail within the entire street. Before both of those investments, their main street was struggling. Restaurants were having a hard time staying open. Businesses were not seeing the foot traffic. And today that is changing. Fishers, Indiana is a tremendous example of uh, infill development and the really their goal of the creation of a new downtown. Fishers has many similarities to Edmonds. It is 30 minutes from Indianapolis. It is a community of choice for families because of their schools, their youth sports, and the lifestyle. They did have an existing municipal center, which you see here in the oval. This picture up here is from 2012 at the top prior to any development, but they really had no true sense of downtown, which is different than, than Edmond. Uh, and so uh, they, had, they did have increasing development pressure coming to them and they realized we need to create a true downtown for our community uh, to give them a sense of place of what it means to live in Fishers, Indiana. So in 2012, they embarked on a, a master plan effort for the Nickel Plate District, which is what they call their downtown. Uh, and part of that master plan effort was to create a form-based code. 
This set the framework for the city to guide development that was coming to them. They realized that development was coming regardless of what we do, it is coming. We better guide that development so we get the community that we want. This all started with two catalytic projects, both that had direct city involvement. The first was a mixed use development right across from City Hall in front of the green. It was a retail and multifamily residential project um, that sits on city owned property. The second was a series of infrastructure improvements that the city made. Some of that was, uh, was improving existing infrastructure. Some of that was creating brand new streets in the Eastern portion of their new downtown. And that was really, again, to set the framework for new development to occur, which as you can see, has happened. Uh, today exists a vibrant and diverse mixed use community with over 15 projects created since 2012 and more still to come. So I hope you're all saying, that's great. This is amazing. How can we have this in Edmond? Um, not surprisingly, we have some ideas. Sitting at the midpoint of downtown core, the creation of a multifunction public open space on Main Street between Broadway and Littler gives a much needed place for the community to gather. Welcome to Main Street Square. With this connection to Broadway, the square is a place that can be a respite for retail customers to linger a bit longer families to let their children eat some ice cream and play, and dedicated space for events, concerts, and festivals. That dedicated space can be used more frequently without impacting parking and vehicular access to the businesses along Broadway. Lastly, with the connection to Littler, the square anchors the connection to the university along Main Street. Of course, for the creation of the square, Main Street in this location has to be close to traffic. Low traffic volumes on Main Street in that block today uh, allow for those volumes to easily be absorbed elsewhere. Necessarily, necessary local access for parking and service and deliveries to the existing buildings can still occur through the existing alleys and surrounding streets. The panel strongly believes that City Hall should have a presence and prominence like no other building in downtown. Through the use of massing, architectural character, and urban design techniques, City Hall should anchor Main Street Square and the downtown with its entrance and activated frontage along the square. Once again, this is a building that will last for generations. So make the most of this opportunity and be bold. Where City Hall should be prominent, the parking garage should not. Uh, it should be located so that it minimizes its frontage on Main Street. Consideration should be given also to the size of the garage uh, to serve primarily and maybe only the necessary functions within City Hall and the Municipal Court. This is because with shared parking techniques and, and, uh, and thought processes, right? The peak times that City Hall and the court are gonna be using that parking is in the middle of the day, Monday through Friday. When do y'all wanna go downtown and eat dinner and get your kids to the park and go to the farmer's market? Well, that's in the evening and that's on Saturday and Sunday. So those peak use times do not overlap. They're, they're perfect marriage with one another. So this can still serve very much as a parking garage for all of downtown uh, and the need for uh, City Hall and the court. Ross touched on it earlier, but the potential arrival of RTA commuter rail services to downtown, the panel recommends that the city consider relocating the farmer's market from Festival Marketplace. 
realize that that is a special place in your community right now. And, and that may be a big ask, uh, but we do, uh, we do offer you to, to consider this from the standpoint of really, again, creating a new place where this farmer's market can occur along with many other events that could happen in Main Street Square. The completion of a new city hall and municipal court will provide tremendous opportunity for new development in the surrounding blocks on both private and city owned property. With a significant number of properties owned by the city that's shown uh, on this map, the city has the opportunity to curate those developments to provide a mix of uses from residential to retail and restaurants, hotel, office, many choices to set the tone for future and further downtown development. Parcels along Main Street and on the square should be considered as priorities to build a sense of place and tell the story. Imagine creating a place that is the heart of Edmond. And with that, I will turn it over to Bill to wrap things up. Good morning, we're almost there. I'm asking you to be bold. You've seen this presentation. What we've asked you to do is to think about a broader vision. Think about what the downtown can be. Think about the opportunity that you have. Create the active core, Main Street Square, a focus. When Brent was showing you what other cities had done, they had created a central place, a location to be able to feed off of. You have an opportunity to do that here. Connect the activity. Make a bigger there. Once you have Main Street Square, connect it up so that your area downtown for redevelopment is larger. Ease the process for private investment. New money is already coming here. We'll talk a little bit in a second. You want to make sure that it is easy for people to be able to apply it under your vision. So expand that vision. Think about that. City halls, as Brent was saying, have a very long life, but they're not operable that many hours. Think about what a green space is. It's open all the time, 365 days a year. Think what the city can do with that. Think what the people can do with that. Think what the traffic does with that. Main Street Square is the down street, is the downtown hub. Make that there bigger. When you can see the connection pattern that Ross went through, the idea is to be able to spread out so that the planning area is not just the old Main Street. The planning area is actually all of the connected downtown. With that, you'll build a canvas that, that developers can use under the guidance of the city's own desires to become through the overlay plan to be able to take advantage of building a huge platform for growth. And I say that as a huge platform for growth because some people say that the economic growth is gonna come out on I-35. The economic growth can be on I-35, but the growth of the community and economic growth takes place right here if this can be done correctly. Now, like we said, private developers are already here. We heard people sold investments in other places to bring money to Edmond. Those developers are coming and they will continue to come. But if you make the process easier, lay that overlay so they can see it. So they're not actually creating something from scratch that you look at and scratch your head. Give them an opportunity to respond back to what you're looking for to build your community downtown. They'll apply. The city should always be thinking about what it can do to increase foot traffic in this area. Foot traffic. You listen to Ross about talking about people driving through. We want them to drive here. So prepare that canvas. We heard from the city that they've already learned a number of things about uh, taking care of stormwater and, and also dealing with some utilities. If you prepare that, that canvas by already doing that kind of work or be prepared to do that, so when the developers come in, they can already see what's being done. That's a huge advantage. Um, when Ann and Temler were talking, they were saying there also have to be some investments in people and in some new groups. All right, I'm not gonna go through all these right here. But one of the things at the bottom, it says uh, civil engagement. One of the things I'd like to see is the civil engagement is going to take place when all of the departments of City Hall are in one building and they might actually run into each other when they're going for coffee. But the idea of this is working together. You heard that from Ann. So what we're asking you to do is think 
about what the new Edmond downtown could be. Think about what it's gonna do with that connection of Main Street Square. You're intentional by development. You're intentional by connecting. You're intentional in creating a social and community experience. And by all of that, you're creating economic velocity. Maybe you can beat out what happens on I-35. So we're asking you, be bold. Think about downtown as a canvas and an opportunity to create something for Edmond that will be the envy of all the surrounding towns and bring economic growth into the center. See that opportunity, see the value of those connections, see the value of that larger pl platform. More people, more activity, more social interaction. You have a stronger community, a more diversified and stable economy, and you're increasing the economic velocity and the options for the city of Edmond to invest for its population. Be bold. Thank you for your time. It's now time for questions. And I'll turn it back over to John. I'm gonna ask Tom to bring me a passionate panel next time. Wow. Yes, we're, we're now going to be open for questions, and we have a format. We're going to start in the room. We have two mics that will travel up and down um, with ULI representatives. If you will state your name and your address for the record and for the video, and we have one right way up, Tom, you'll get your exercise. <clears throat> if you'll ask your question, I will repeat it because it's not always heard by everyone, even with the mic. And then I'll ask uh, the appropriate panelist to go ahead and uh, try to answer your question or um, tell you we can't. Hi there. Sorry. My name is Anthony Catania. I'm an architect. Uh, I'm working on several projects in the, in the study area here. I currently live in Oklahoma City, but uh, I'm looking to uh, potentially relocate to this area. Um, I also work on Broadway a few days a week. Um, so I was curious and, and happy to hear several of the panelists touch on the value of a form-based code. And I thought maybe you might elaborate a little bit on the process that the city of Edmond should take to enact a form-based code, uh, some of the key elements that it should have. Um, and then by extension of that, uh, maybe you could touch on um, a unifi unified development code and the potential that might have to, uh, to coordinate the regulations of the various city departments. Okay, that was a, a long question, but basically I'm going to ask Tamala to start and uh, maybe uh, Brent or uh, Ross to, to follow on form-based codes and unified codes, how, how practically the city could do it without instructing the city because uh, they're their own government entity, but there are some things out there that you can use and share as examples. Right, so thank you for the question. And it's, I think, thinking about form-based and it, for those of you who aren't aware of what a form-based code is, really it's a code that starts on a, a, an understanding of various form and form is, is building structure of where those forms are, what are some of the consistent elements that need to exist in those forms and then how do you then start layering use into the, the built environment. Implementing a form-based code just kind of 100% off the bat is, is difficult and probably not practical just because there are existing uses in place and there are existing ways that the community needs to kind of transition from how they've done development in the past to how they're doing working right now. But one of the things that should be considered in creating the form base is what are the standards that are important to the city in terms of driving where certain activities occur what types of scales you see in certain districts, and then how you wanna start encouraging, I'll call them adjacencies, but uses that are compatible, uses that feed off of each other and uses that continue to build um, excitement for other activities. So doing that is really gonna be a multiple step activity, which is about, again, figuring out where are those areas where defining structure design standpoint or design standards 
um, time frames for development make sense, and then those areas that should come into the into the play a little bit further down the path. Anyone else want to add? Yeah, I'll I'll just build off of what Tamala said in that um, you know a form based code is is very much for for most people that have anything to do with uh, reading codes, writing codes, uh, deciphering codes. We're all used to the kind of code that you have now, which is all about use and where you can build certain types of things within your community um, and, and more technical standards. Um, a form-based code is, is really about what is the character of the place. Uh, it is about, as Tamala said, it is about the form uh, and how tall is a building, how does it relate to the street, what is the streetscape character that is in front of it, what, how does the sidewalk work with the street, how does parking work with the street, so on and so forth. So um, I agree 100% with Tamla's uh, comment that to for most communities to jump straight into a form-based code is very challenging. Um, there are steps that can be taken. You know, we discussed the overlay district. Um, there could be uh, guidelines that are enacted with the overlay district that is a starting point to start to set the framework for what some of those things should be, whether those are architectural standards, those are streetscape standards, whatever those may be, but it begins to uh, create that form uh, that you could then roll into a more complete form-based code. Tom Robbins, I live at 1000 Prospect Court here in Edmond. My question is, given the depth of knowledge that you all have as, as experts in planning, given the kind of tipping point we're at now is the fifth largest city in Oklahoma, one, how surprising is it that we as a city are the only one over 50,000 that doesn't have a general obligation fund, uh, bond uh, for long-term infrastructure projects? And how could that, uh, if implemented, be a catalyst or what are some of the thoughts around how to do that successfully as a city is looking to use that potentially as a, as a tool uh, to spur some of this growth. So to summarize the question, the question is um, regarding general obligation bonds and the fact that uh, for the most part, Edmund has not uh, followed that path of uh, financing its projects and um, I will start by saying we spent a considerable amount of time at every juncture of this week uh, asking questions about it, listening to answers about it, uh, hearing the feedback from it. Um, I don't think it'd be surprised to anyone in this room that it is a uh, an issue that uh, is before your council, before your community. Um, I, I don't think we would make a recommendation, but I'd like any panelist that uh, has a thought on it to to kind of share what other communities have done, how other communities have uh, uh, found those financing approaches to work for their communities. And Jeff is going to answer that mic on the far end. All right. Sorry. Um well, I would in inject a word into the conversation, that being pragmatism. Um, we're asking you to be bold. We're not asking you to be dogmatic about any of this. We think this vision can really accelerate uh, not just the study area, but the city overall. And so we know that something like a general obligation bond is allows cities to do big things. Um, it's, it is a tool that is used throughout the country. This is, it's not an exotic tool. Um, it's a pragmatic tool. It's not something you should use just because of somebody else is doing it. It's also not something that, um, that you want to use, um, um, you know, without a lot of thought and, and, and planning, because again, just like a city hall, a, a general obligation bond is going to be with you for a long time. So there has to be a lot of planning, but it certainly is a tool to do big things. We're asking you to do big things. We would ask you as a community to consider the tools that allow you to reach this vision. And if you have a um, dogmatic issue with that, you know, I, I, I think then you're, you're sort of, you know, you're, you're not leading the way. The people that are open-minded trying to get to the vision, keep your eye on the vision 
not on the not on the every you may not agree with every step to get there but agreeing that this is the vision will allow then the toolbox to open itself and then you can kind of determine what knobs to turn with that toolbox and i think a geo bond is the same idea right so there's technicalities around that but at least understand that don't close the door on any tools to allow you to get to that vision until you have good reasons for it anyone else i would add that at many communities that uh, rely on general obligation bonds don't really have another source of revenue and um, you have to weigh in any community that has numerous sorts of, of revenue we would always recommend weigh the cost the resources versus the opportunity and uh, conclude with uh, hopefully some logic and, and some uh, application of good rules of practice um. I was just a little confused. I'm a banker, so before anyone starts throwing rocks or anything, yeah, uh, just give us your name okay, and address. Sorry, Marcus, you. I'm Marcus Godsey, and I work for Prosperity, but President of Prosperity Bank here in Edmond. And um, we uh, constantly get uh, each month we get something from the Edmond Economic Development Council regarding uh, residential building permits pulled, sales pulled, average sales size and price range of, of, of homes and and seems like the last one i read something like you what brought this up is you had said earlier that that families were getting smaller and household demands were getting smaller and sizes of homes were getting smaller in your, in your mind and what you said but yet the reports that we get are like the the average building permit for the uh, for the edmund area is like four hundred and forty six thousand dollar price size and price range homes and 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 existing home sales are like three three hundred fifty thousand or something like that on average and that that doesn't seem to me to equate to smaller homes smaller families when we're selling average homes at four hundred forty six thousand dollar price range it's kind of so, so the the question as i heard it is we we talked about some data that i think uh, Jeff presented that was related to national trends as opposed to specific Edmund trends. But Jeff, could you elaborate sure. on what the what how your numbers um, would would be applied toward Edmund's current situation versus looking forward? I think it's a matter of. Um... The, the situation that you described, we're very aware, 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 aware of, and it's very much supply driven, right? So, so you all are very, very good at providing the suburban model that, that I would say at least two thirds of the nation is looking for, right? So you're meeting the demand for call it two thirds to three fourths of people looking for homes. What you're not meeting the demand for is a third to 25% of the of the demand that's out there. You don't see it in the sales numbers because you don't have the supply to meet the demand. And that's really what we're saying is that you got the two the three fourths down, but you you're really really lacking that that quarter per, you know that that 25% of housing demand it could be more than that. And we see that demand going elsewhere. So you're losing you're losing market share, even though you're growing your overall market share, you've lost the you've lost the market share for that expanding market of smaller households. And that's the key too, is going forward, that market is going to continue to grow. So we're not and just we we don't think that what we've described does anything to negatively impact your position as the leading suburban growth model in Oklahoma City. It's both, right? It's yes and, and that's that's where we want you to kind of open open the vision to to something even more to layer on top of what you're already successful at. And I think to summarize what what John had said, following that is that you have the opportunity to have more people that actually serve your community in in those jobs that can't afford a $445,000 medium priced house to come and live in Edmond 
to get rid of the commute that ties up the highways, that spends their money, increases the cost for employees to be and not have to be subsidized to pay for the gas to come 25 or 30 miles. Um, we have we have one more panelist I'd like to add. Hey, Ann? I would also like to add that in our interviews with folks who came in to talk to us, we interviewed more than a few who told us that their kids, who are the age of my kids, who are young adults, young professionals, maybe even beginning to think about starting a family, can't find a place to live here in the community. And there's a lot of folks who grew up here who love it here, but they're moving to Oklahoma City because that meets their need for a home for now. So that's another thing that really brought it home for me. I know I want my kids and grandkids to be close to me, and I would want them to have a community where they could do that. We have an online question. Tom, do you want to uh, state that question? Yeah, John, we have almost 40 people online who are watching this in addition to who's here. But I do have one from Drew, and I'll try to paraphrase it. It's very long. But um, infill developers in downtown Edmond, um, face several challenges getting projects to pencil, but one key issue is the barrier for stormwater management detention. Any project with more than two residential units currently, currently triggers detention, a detention requirement, which can kill a small scale project. Can any of the panels speak, can the panelists speak to this um, issue and how it might be addressed? I know we talked about that in our deliberations, but I don't know whether Ross or um, uh, Brent, whether you can talk to that. So, so the question is um, some more elaboration on stormwater management uh, in relation to not the rules today, but how could we um, look at the future of having stormwater management that uh, it didn't add such a burden to a small development? Um, I'll do my best to play uh, a moderately talented civil engineer, which I, I'm not anywhere close to that. Um, uh, you know, I think it, it falls back on uh, really, again, you know, what can the, what is storm, stormwater management is a tool that the city can provide from an infrastructure standpoint that will uh, encourage redevelopment of your downtown. Um, most downtown communities uh, have some sort of common way to handle stormwater. It is not feasible for every single property owner to deal with stormwater on their own property uh, when you have a more densely populated place. Um, there are lots and lots of different ways to uh, achieve that. And I understand that you all have started that process with the Stevenson Park uh, redevelopment and enhancement, uh, as well as the the pond in the northwest corner of our study area across the track. So y'all are starting that process. That doesn't mean you know, that that process is probably done, right? It, the more you develop, the more stormwater, the more uh, impervious surface you're going to have that you have to deal with. So uh, it's going to be a constant thing that that you're going to need to study and evaluate um, and plan for, uh, and certainly better to plan for it now uh, than when uh, you have to deal with it because of those pressures. We have uh, another could, response from John. If, and then do we have a question up here? Right after John finishes, we'll go with the question up in the uh, audience. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, I'm not going to try and play landscape architect like Brent, uh, but I'm going to say that uh, any it, densification that you add to an area, any hardscape that you add to an area, it inevitably increases the amount of, of stormwater run stormwater runoff you're going to produce. Uh, these sort of densifying activities have to go hand in hand with public sector infrastructure improvements, with uh, with range improvements, and the there's a vehicle in place. The city's put a vehicle in place, the TIF district, to finance those improvements. We just have to make sure that as we add these this density to the area, the TIF district is at the same time developing plans, going through design development for for stormwater improvement uh, to to complement the added density that we're that we're putting in the area. So we've wet the appetite of our panel with that question, Ross. Quickly, please. Yes, this is just one instance of why 
the uh, development codes need to be updated and revised for infill development downtown. Mixed use development and infill development have their own special challenges. So the code has to recognize those challenges, whether it's storm water or parking or the life safety aspects of the building. It's different for multi-story infill buildings than it is for single purpose buildings out in the more um, single lot suburban area. Thank you. Question up above. Um, any thoughts to fighting the density opposition that's um, pretty obvious in the Edmond community. Um, there's been several multifamily projects that have been um, announced and, and never come to fruition kind of in this area and in this core. So it, kind of any thoughts to um, how to overcome those specific issues? Um, I, all of us have our own thoughts. We're, we're not here to address um, anything other than the study area and anything other than our best recommendations. And, and you've heard what our expertise uh, promotes and thinks and has given to your community, but I, we're not gonna respond to what happens in other places at this time. Hi, thanks for coming today. Hey, um, my name is Ken Cappers, um, and there's a great downtown right now. I greatly support the downtown area. It's fantastic. Um, there are two uh, uh, entities within your study area um, that I haven't heard mentioned, and that's a house of worship in the Edmond Police Department. Were they interviewed? I'd have to defer to staff, I think. Yes, they were. The answer is yes, according to Ann. Can you address that? Um, they are will be listed, all of the people that we interviewed will be listed in the final report. I know that we spoke with a minister from First Methodist and also from First Christian Churches. Right, thank you. I don't think we spoke with the police department. Uh, thank you all again for being here this week. I'm Josh Moore, uh, a home builder, developer, and uh, council member, current council member. Can we a little bit more on housing in the study area. And I thought it was interesting uh, that, that you use the word mix, mix housing together instead of obviously we're used to outside of the study area, neighborhoods that are um, monolithic or, or suburban homes. And so can you go into, and I, I'm familiar in other downtown cores or areas where this concept of mixing price points together and, and either in, in TIF involvement in that or city involvement in that with the developer. Can you, can one of you go into that a little bit deeper? Anybody want to take that one, John? And, and the question is basically, given the fact that the core housing in the community is single family, larger lots, um, suburban design uh, facilities or homes, that um, how, how does the mixed pricing and style of homes work in a, in a more core urban design? Yeah, it's a great question. <clears throat> so there's a market difference between a uh, for sale product uh, uh, and a rental product, of course. Um, the easiest thing to do is in terms of the easy button, I always like to look for the easy button. The easiest thing to do in terms of developing a mixed uh, income or mixed use project is to go from the rental perspective, uh, just because um, prog programs like the tax credit program that finances uh, essential worker housing, uh, these programs are rental housing focused. And so uh, it's much easier to develop that sort of uh, uh, mixed income rental project because you can, you can use that, 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 that asset, that tool. Uh, when it comes to uh, for sale product products, I mean, we've had conversations with your, with your folks here in the planning department and other folks uh, that have illustrated the challenges in the state uh, in terms of developing condo products and condominium products. And so there will always, but there will always be an opportunity uh, to develop a for sale product that is dense that, that, you know, some, I'm thinking of something like a townhouse or a row house that where you have fee simple ownership retained, right? Where you still have fee simple ownership, but you can still add units to, uh, or more dwelling units to an acre. Uh, that is another opportunity to, again, provide the mixed income product if you can, inject uh, purchase assistance programs into that and uh, help uh, essential workers with down payments and with, uh, with you know, barriers to entry into the homeownership. 
Uh, those are always opportunities in those situations. And uh, again, you know, the importance of allowing a essential worker or a, a frontline worker the opportunity to acquire fee simple ownership in the community is a huge boon to that to that to that individual's family and 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 that uh, that individual individual's overall economic health and going forward in the future. So. We have one, and this needs to be our last question because your airlines don't allow us to just choose when we want to leave. It's all the way up, Matt. Uh, so we we got to get some people to the airport. Uh, we'll we'll hang around for a few minutes afterward. I don't want to leave time for that, John. There's no other other online questions except one, which is how can they get a hold of the presentation? Okay, let me while we're start before we do that question. Um, we're, we have delivered to the city and the other sponsors a copy of this presentation, the, the PowerPoint portion. I assume that there's a video and there's a tape recording of this meeting that will be made available, and I'll let Scott address that when he comes up to close the meeting. But uh, six weeks from now uh, is our goal to have the full written report in the hands of the sponsors. Uh, the sponsors determine how and when that would be distributed. Uh, it will be um, a complete version of what we've done, a presentation version of today. And as Tom's over there wincing, I would not plan on less than 75 days. He was wincing pretty, pretty hard. All right, next, last question. Yeah, hi, my name's Jared Prince. I work with the City of Edmond Parks Department, but I'm also a, a resident uh, here in Edmond. But um, full disclosure, I'm also the person that's over at the farmer's market. So I think uh, displacing that is understandable to an extent. I'll get to that in a minute. But my first question would be if we're moving a, I know a challenge that we've had in discussions was where that transportation hub could or couldn't be. And that place is a thing you mentioned about a consideration for that. Is there any type of uh, numerical data on what we think the influx in like transient presence would be once that hub becomes right so close to our new developments as well as like that rail yard development and whatnot. So it's really a question of if the transportation hub continues to really uh, grow its footprint and what is coming to admin from Oklahoma City that right now we don't have a real challenge with that, um, with that population coming to admin. Not that it's not something that we can't, you know, plan for, but at the same time, we don't have infrastructure that's right there at that farmer's market location for that. Second would be, um, if we were to relocate it, were you, were you able to identify a space besides that Main Street Park that would exist at a farmer's market to go? So so the question uh, would be one that Ross would address. I will let you guys know, we, we discussed that a lot because it, it was a little bit of, of a... Uh, we felt friction from our interviews, and we also felt that that um, we needed to address it. So, uh, Ross, just just talk to us a little bit about the process, the location that you proposed, and maybe other locations that we considered. Yeah, we uh, we did take a look at the um, the site south of Second, near where the uh, current maintenance uh, facility is. Um, as well as the existing festival market where the where the buses um, focus their service currently. Uh, we did not look at or consider other sites. Again, um, a lot of work's been done. There's a lot of time yet before um, decisions are made. As I alluded to earlier, the railroad's going to have significant influence because commuter rail is going to use their tracks in the right of way. Um, it's a balancing act. It's important to ask for what you want and for what you believe would be best for the city and its residents. Um, our view, based on our brief time here and looking at the existing pattern and the future needs, is that that festival market, that, that Main Street connection um, may be the most favorable for the city. It would turn out otherwise, but from a pedestrian perspective, that is the strongest. Um, in terms of transient use, look around the region. Um, what's the experience elsewhere? Um, I mean, most of the people, we're, we're talking about passengers, customers, employees um, needing this service. There are other things that could activate that space when the buses um, are not there. 
um, both throughout the day as well as on other um, the weekend days. So it's, we believe the right location and like any other place, it's one to be managed. Um, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be concerned or afraid of who's going to be there. You simply want more people there. Um, find, find the uses to make it active. And I think um, everyone is happy. And so I'll add this, this gives me a chance to close with, we, we explored some of the successes that you guys have had as a community when there was a collaborative effort between all the different stakeholders. And those are incredible and very effective and add value to your community. So I will tell you, we were pretty adamant, not pretty. We were very adamant that having torchbearers for the different needs of your community related to the different parts of your community are real important. And we interviewed a number of your staff that have three jobs in our view that they are responsible for. So it's real hard to be the torch bearer for a lot of different things. And with what's happening in that study area, we clearly believe the study area needs to have a, a, a real panel of um, stakeholders that includes all representation, school district, university, uh, city, um, businesses. And, and so we don't want to tell you how to do it. We just want to say, find a way. Communication is not going to hurt the ultimate result. And many of the questions I've heard up here would probably be resolved better if there was a, a official way to communicate, not a governing body, guys. It is a group of people that can get together and represent fairly their perspective with an intent to create a, a consensus uh, result, if not a unanimous result. I want to thank you guys for letting us uh, spend this time in your community. I loved being here again, and I look forward to coming back again and seeing what's happened. So, Scott, I'm going to leave it to you to close us down. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, one more time, can we give a round of applause to our panelists? <laughs> Just in short, I would say this is not a one-year plan. This is not a five-year plan. This is not a 10-year plan. This is probably a 20 year or, or multi-generational plan. There's some things we'll immediately start working on, but there'll be some, like they said, we'll take some quite a bit of community conversation. There might be, I call it some days you may look, this might be a calculus question and you don't know how to do calculus, but we'll learn and, and we'll adapt to that. So thank you again for all being here. This is just the start. Thank all those who are online uh, for being here. I see many people back on there. And if you have questions at the end, I know um, there'll be staff as well as panelists that'll have a few minutes to talk and appreciate your time. Thanks so much.